get started. Once again, welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature on wolves, jackals, and foxes, the canyons of India, presented by NADHAB expedition leader Surya Ramachandran. Surya is one of our top guides in all of India, and we're really honored to have him with us today. Uh, Surya and I had a, the opportunity to, to spend some time together in the mountains of Colorado when he was out here for one of our guide trainings, and he's really going above and beyond today. It is 1 a.m. his time. Uh, but he's up ready to entertain us all. So Surya, thank you again so much. I'm gonna hand things over to you. Sure thing, Ted, thank you so much. Um, hello everyone, uh, uh, let's start off right away. I'm, I'm just going to turn off my camera to save the bandwidth too. I just wanted you all to know who it is that is speaking or who, what is the voice you're hearing. And I will come back on at the end of the presentation um, for Q&A. Okie dokie, so here we go. Wolves, jackals, foxes, the canids of India. That's me, and that's what I do. I try to set up some interesting projects throughout India with the community so that non-protected areas in India can become community reserves in the years to come, which is totally autonomous and controlled and the uh, benefits of wilderness tourism and the wilderness around is felt by the community themselves and that's kind of what we do in india and today i'm going to be talk, talking about one of my favorite topics uh, interestingly it is not very often spoken about in india i'm not sure what uh, exactly the scene is in the states but in india uh, we often speak about the tigers and sometimes the sloth bear and we speak about uh, uh, leopards and sometimes even birds but even in my last one decade of working in the wilderness of India, we don't hear people talking much about the canids. In fact, not many Indians know that we have wolf packs like this in India. Even people in India don't know that. So that is the status of uh, canids in India. And I'm feeling quite privileged to be sharing their story with you all. So before we jump into the world of Indian canids, I'd like to give you all a little roundup of how many canids we have in the world. We have around 40 different canids. And when I say canids, different kinds of dogs is what you would consider canids. Uh, without the retractable claws, with a sharp muzzle, and uh, a particular kind of dentition. And that's what characterizes a dog. So these are some of the 40 species of dogs that we find all over the world. And in India, we have six species of dogs. Uh, when I, there is seven here, as you can see, but this, uh, the striped hyena technically is not a canid. Uh, it is actually a cross between a canid and a mustelid. So when I say a mustelid, it will be a between a canid and a weasel maybe, because it has a musk gland like weasels and martens and uh, badgers do. So it's not a true canid and even its mouth parts aren't the same. But since we have only six canids in India to talk about, and the hyena is a lonesome one, I thought might as well include that one too in our talk. And these lovely caricatures are done by a friend of mine, Rohan. He runs a beautiful website called Green Humor. Whenever you have time, please do check it out. It's quite fantastic. So let's jump right in. So this is a realistic picture of the canids we have in India. And we'll be spending some time today talking about each of them, where they're found, what they do, their natural history, the issues of conservation that each of them face, and what strata of the ecosystem they belong to. So we are going to be discussing all of that today. So let's start with my favorite, the wild dog or the dole. So we, a lot of people in the uh, world over call it the Asiatic wild dog because it is uh, close to the, it's very similar to the painted dogs of Africa but not in appearance, but in behavior. But actually it's called the Dole, D-H-O-L-E. And the genus is entirely different. It's, called, it's from a genus called Kuan, Kuan alpinus, which is very different from the rest of the canids of the world. So it's a very interesting animal. Uh, for a lot of you may think it looks like a fox with a black tail, but yes, it does look like a fox with a black tail, but it is much bigger, much taller, and the entire face looks very different. What we need to know about the Dole, the Dole is the red dog of India, also known as the whistling dogs of India. And they are the top carnivore in the Indian jungle. Why would I say they are the top carnivore in the Indian jungle when you have carnivores like the tiger? 
it's simply because a good formidable pack of dogs can pretty much hunt successfully on a daily basis and nothing really comes in their way i've seen a pack of 26 dogs there are people who've recorded even higher but on an average you can see a pack can be anything between 7 to 15 dogs uh, will be an average and a pack that size needs to feed on a daily basis so they can be quite a force in the jungle and why are they successful uh, on almost on a hundred percent basis when uh, cats uh, we, we hear that cats like tigers and even lions or cheetahs succeed once in every eight to nine hunts that's because they don't rely on the element of surprise most of the canids especially the wild dogs rely on re uh, a long chase you know they rely on their stamina they give a long chase to the deer so that right at the end the deer just collapse after getting tired and the dogs can just finish them off that's kind of how they hunt and that strategy has made sure that they are successful 100 percent of the time and it can be quite interesting to watch them on a hunt unlike in africa where you see the painted dogs hunting over the grasslands these dogs actually hunt across woodland so it's not as easy to follow it but in occasions like this when they hunt in the grasslands it is quite a sight for us in india so here you can see this dog chasing a herd of spotted deer and you can see a peacock also flying away and the rest of the dogs are around so they actually form like a circle around the deer and chase them from all sides so it is a strategy not just about stamina but there's a lot more happening there and the dogs are fearless they know that they're tough so we've seen dogs steal kills from tigers we've seen them intimidate tigers as you can see here this is a video grab i have from one of my videos uh, this leopard is trying to take this dead sambar deer which is a kind of large deer which we have in india and the alpha dog has come and he takes a bite of the leopard's back and chases him off and then comes back with the rest of the pack to feed on the sambar and that is how uh, aggressive these dogs can be towards other carnivores or even other species in the jungle i've seen them go after bears go after tigers or even just tease the tiger just what's fun if they come across one and that's how interesting the pack dynamics are but a lone dog on the other hand will behave very differently and we'll get to that in a bit group dynamics alphas workers pairs and loners so i'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the wolves in yellowstone uh, you often see great packs in the lamar valley and parts of uh, hudson valley and places like that uh, but what is interesting about the wild dogs is the dynamics is pretty much the same so you do have an alpha pair and a few other adults which form the pack and then they generally give birth in the month of january and that is the winter in india and after about two months the young ones are ready to join the adults on the hunt but ever so often what happens is there is a few members which which are pushed away from the main pack and they are forced to become roam around as loners or as a pair or sometimes they form small coalitions that may not be a true pack but they do often jo join together because that is their strength so we come across lone dogs and pairs more often than packs because packs move together in one part of the jungle whereas a lot of loners and pairs roam in different parts of the jungle and they very often just have to scavenge to survive in the forest so they take off remains of hills from leopards and tigers they try to meet up with other dogs but usually the loner survives when he finds a mate and starts his own pack and that is generally how the dynamics works in dogs and what we have also seen is uh, multiple packs like there could be two packs of six dogs and eight dogs and sometimes they may get together to form a pack of 14. i, I think i got the math there right so they do form a pack of 14 and to bring down larger prey so that also happens so there is no real concept of territories or anything but it is all about the dynamics within the pack so it's very different from what we understand in cats or even uh, cats which work together like lions even they have territories but dogs interestingly just follow the prey and this is also the same dole 
And interestingly, this animal lives in the high Himalaya. All of this while we are talking about the dole which lives in the Indian subcontinent, uh, in the plains and in the forests. But there is the same wild dog, the dole, which lives in the high Himalaya at 13,000 feet. And you can see how rich in color and how bushy and fluffy this animal is. And this, interestingly, is the original form of this animal. The hypothesis or the theory goes that during the last ice ages, the, lep the tigers, uh, not the leopards, sorry, the tigers and the dole moved down from the Arctic towards the tropics because of the ice ages. The, the, everything was freezing over in the, in the northern latitudes. But by the time they reached uh, the southern tip of India, Sri Lanka had already broken off, which is why we don't have tigers or wild dogs in Sri Lanka. And these animals have adapted to live in the Indian forests. And interestingly, it is only the tiger and the dole that cool off in the water in the summer months. No other carnivore does that in India. So it kind of supports the hypothesis that they don't actually belong in these tropical latitudes, but they move from somewhere else. But if you go up into the Himalayas where the conditions are still cold, you do come across ever so often these dogs that look much like what they would have looked like 30,000 years ago during the last ice ages. So what happens when you have a rampant pack of 25 dogs in a forest patch hunting successfully on a daily basis? They're going to wipe out the deer population. They're going to cause a huge imbalance uh, if they survive together and if they survive as a pack for a year or two. And then what happens to the other carnivores? What happens to the grasslands? What happens to the whole uh, ecological cycle that is so fragile. So a dog population can actually disrupt that. So interestingly, what we have seen, I'm not sure there is much proof to this, but what we have seen is ever so often, every year or every two, three years, there is a disease like the canine distemper or a mange, uh, which gets into a dog uh, a population. And these dole, generally, suddenly their numbers start dropping. And when their numbers drop, they disperse and they uh, try to find others and they move to other areas. So they, there is a chance for the ungulates and the uh, herbivores to regain their populations so that the balance is restored. So initially, we were all very worried when we saw dogs disappearing and suddenly we don't see any dogs. We were thinking like only last few months ago, we saw a pack of 25, but suddenly we are seeing only a few dogs. And sometimes they're seeing no dogs for a whole year. And then we realized that possibly this is what it is because the dogs eventually came back. But by the time the deer numbers had augmented to such a good number that we were worried that there's too much deer and the dogs came and set things right. So it is a very interesting thought process where one can say, is culling actually necessary? Is actually killing off of things actually necessary when there is actually a way in nature to sort this out? Maybe what I'm saying doesn't apply to every part of the world, but it definitely definitely applies to the situation with wild dogs or the dole. So the dole is widespread. It is a top carnivore in India. But interestingly, there is another canid, uh, which is the Indian golden jackal, which behaves quite the opposite, despite having very similar characteristics. So all of you, a lot of you who have been to Africa would have seen the black-backed jackal in Africa or the side striped if you've been really lucky. So in India, we have only one species of jackal, which is the Indian golden jackal. So this is a very, very interesting animal. It is an omnipresent animal. It is an animal found all over the country from the high Himalaya to the cities, to the farms, to the, uh, to the gardens, to the semi-urban rural areas, and also in the mangrove and coastal ecosystems. So these, you can see here, this uh, jackal is roaming amongst uh, mangrove roots along the coastal belts. So jackals are found everywhere. In fact, they are the most widespread scavenger in our country. And these animals are often seen singly or in pairs because they do mate for life and they do form pairs for life. But ever so often in uh, habitats where there is good prey availability, even sometimes in urban areas where there is a lot of waste, these dogs form packs sometimes as big as 8 to 12. And uh, these jackals move around at night. I mean, they're truly, truly nocturnal. Uh, in fact, the animal we were talking about earlier, the dole, that's uh, active only during the day. In fact, they hunt during the day like the African dogs do. 
but uh, these jackals are ever so nocturnal but interestingly they are also very adaptive so we have generally seen jackals in most of their habitats only as scavengers but in certain forest areas in the country we've realized that jackals have figured out the birthing season for deer and they all go after a deer fawn they go after monkeys which come down to feed on the berries which have fallen on the ground and sometimes the coalitions go after adult deer and this is very strange for such a small canid because again they use their whole tactic of chasing deer down and tiring them out and then slowly bringing them down because a jackal by itself or even a few jackal may not be strong enough to bring down a large deer but they do that ever so often like you can see in this picture so it is a an animal which is probably the most adaptive the most suited for such a high and such a high developing country like india with such a huge number of people uh, the jackal is probably the one animal that i see which will fit in and still do well dis despite the odds against it and you can see an example of that here so here you see i have a pack of wild dogs which have brought down a deer and this jackal is still trying to get try is trying his luck even with his tail tucked in between his legs he is trying to approach the dogs and see if he can get a morsel so that is kind of how jackals survive i've seen them do that with tigers i've seen them do that with leopards i've seen them do that with other jackals with wild dogs and sometimes like i told you they do hunt also so here you have a large male jackal uh, feeding on a dead cow because in india in a lot of places people don't eat beef because it's uh, considered uh, against their religion which is hinduism so a lot of the dead cows are thrown out and the jackals have again figured that out and most of these areas where the cattle carcasses are dumped the jackals can be seen in very very good numbers and what happens when you have an animal which is found in the mangroves which is found in the forests and it is found in the snow cap peaks in the himalayas you're going to have it looking very different so all of these are indian golden jackals can if you can believe that so this is a very mangy one which lives in the hot coastal areas of india this is a picture of a jackal from 12000 feet in the himalaya and this is a very odd specimen which is a melanistic or a black jackal which is found in some parts of india so it is actually a color aberration which is not anything different but again you can see the physical uh, appearance the dimensions of the animal is quite different this, uh, depending on which part of the country they are from and that is obviously down to the differences in the weather that is down to the differences in the prey that they get uh, how much food availability there is and of course there is a lot to do with the gene pool of that population maybe if someone actually does a dna uh, uh, like a dna a test of the different populations in the country they may turn out to be different subspecies of jackals you never know so but for now all of these are indian golden jackals but for such a widespread animal which is so adaptive the jackal is also unfortunately the animal me i personally have most encountered on road kills in fact on certain roads in the country you can be sure that you're going to see at least 10 to 12 jackals dead every night because like i told you they will some of these jackals have actually figured out that the the vehicle traffic runs over rodents runs over birds so they wait along the roadside to come and catch uh, take their morsel of meat and run away but a lot of them do die in that process otherwise when you have roads which are cutting through fields when the jackals cross over they get killed over there too so in a lot of the country there is a lot of jackals dying on a very regular basis almost every night because of road traffic sometimes because of poisoning of carcasses to kill another animal like a leopard or a wolf or the jackal which is also feeding on the same carcass tends to die too so adaptive yes omnipresent yes a great number yes but can it still do well with what is happening with india with the large highways excess traffic so much development it is a test of the time for the indian golden jackal but if you think the jackal is having a tough time you can be sure that the indian gray wolf which is the canis lupus palatus is having a tougher time so all of you need to get used to the idea that this is a wolf in india so this is the same species of wolf that all of you see in alaska or canada or yellowstone 
or any part of the US or Europe. So there is only one species of true wolf in the world, which is Canis lupus. So this is a subspecies called the Indian gray wolf, which is Canis lupus palapus, which basically looks like a, a large dog with a big head. But in reality, it is a wolf. So to get your head around uh, the idea that this is a wolf, I'm going to show you some morphs of the Indian wolf. So these are the different kinds of colors that the Indian wolves come in. You have the dark morph, the tawny colors, the pale colors, the, the typical gray, and of course, the brown morph. So on all these things, you can see it's a very lanky, tall animal with a large head. And that is pretty much the distinctive character of the Indian gray wolf. And these animals survive in habitats like this. So they survive, unfortunately, in one of the most threatened habitats in India. So imagine a country with 1.3 billion people which wants to expand its cities, build roads, airports, highways, factories. Will they do it in the high Himalaya? Will they do it in our coast? Or will they do it in open flat terrain like these grasslands, which the wolves need? So India is losing a lot of its grasslands on a very regular basis. And along with that, there is a huge threat to this animal here. It's a beautiful picture by a friend of mine whose name is Meher Godbole. And he has been documenting these wolves which live in non-protected grasslands in the country. And you can see how these wolves are surviving in these grasslands right next to a big city here. And that is what they do. And these grasslands, it probably takes only a few years for some big project to come here. And this will be over before you know it. And this whole population of wolves would have disappeared. Another interesting ecosystem that the wolves thrive in are the ravines in parts of northern India. Again, here, a lot of hiding spaces, a lot of open terrain for a chase, and a lot of uh, move, uh, space to move around for the wolves. So again, like the wild dog, the wolves don't have territories, so they move around a large area. In fact, <clears throat> uh, we're going to talk about what wolves actually do in India, which is quite interesting. So the natural history of the Indian gray wolf is very interesting. So imagine that almost the entire part of India at one point had wolves. And these wolves were hunting antelope like the Indian gazelle. And they were also hunting hare. They were hunting some birds. The larger packs were bringing down larger prey like, the, uh, like larger antelopes and deer. But there's always been an interesting association of wolves with people all over the world. You know, wolves are always there in the bad stories. Like that in India too, wolves are there in the bad stories. So sites like this are not so common these days. Uh, there is a one path in India, in Western India, where you can actually see very good population of wolves because there's very high numbers of these gazelle. And the wolves hunt them over there in these well-protected grassland ecosystems. But this is the only grassland ecosystem that's protected in the country, unfortunately. So this is the only good place where you can see wolves in such numbers and doing what they were supposed to do naturally. But otherwise, wolves live in the fields and uh, agricultural land in the countries. They live in pasture land, they live in grasslands, and they live in fields. And in fact, they live in very well in these uh, secondary ecosystems. So they live, sometimes you can see packs of about 20 wolves in just fields and that's what they do and what do they do here they follow herdsmen they follow nomadic herders who have hundreds and thousands of sheep and these uh, nomadic herders take their flock through the seasons to different parts of the country uh, to find uh, green pastures for their grazing for the grazing for their sheep and these wolves follow them and that's what they've been doing always the wolves have always been associated with nomadic herders like I told you, they do not have territories. So they do follow nomadic herders in different parts of the country. So that is the, I wouldn't say a symbiotic relationship, it's anything but that. But that is the partnership that is there. And that is, uh, there is a lot of folklore connecting the wolves and these nomadic herders. And if you, th if you think we know enough of the wolves, uh, about the wolves and grasslands, forests and this, last year, interestingly, someone documented wolves in mangrove ecosystems along the coast in slushy wet brackish water ecosystems what is this wolf doing there we don't know i mean we only have one photographic record of wolves from the swamps of india but we don't know what else that the wolf is doing there what does it feed on does it wait for the turtles to come to the beach uh, to lay their eggs to catch them i don't know what they do but except that we have this one interesting picture of a wolf 
in the swamp mangrove eco ecosystem. And of course, when you have wolves anywhere in the world, there is always going to be conflict. So like I told you, wolves traditionally hunted gazelle. But when you have most of their natural ecosystem converted into fields, what are they going to hunt? They're going to breed in these secondary ecosystems and they take down uh, cattle, they take down sheep, they take down goat, and ever so often they are poisoned. In fact, there are some historical stories of wolves being man-eaters in India. I have, I have my uh, doubts on the credibility of those stories, but there have been a few reports of wolves taking children in some rural parts of the country. But having said that, those stories are few and far between. But the actual problem is with wolves and pastoralists who have large flocks of sheep and cows. And the tolerance is not as high anymore because even their grazing grounds are very limited. So the income that they generate from the sheep and goats are very limited. So every loss, especially during times like this, when the wolf is denning with a litter to feed, or they will hunt on a daily basis. And a farmer who is losing his sheep on a daily basis is not going to be happy. So even though it is against the law, they do poison carcasses ever so often. So we are losing wolves at a great number. So maybe in my lifetime, I would be surprised if the wolves last out in India, at least in most parts of the country, uh, unless something drastically changes about our attitude towards grasslands and its incredible predators. But interestingly, we saw one other beautiful event in one of the forests in central India. We saw a lone wolf which was roaming around in the forest for a long time and suddenly he found a pack of dogs which took him in and this wolf and this pack of dogs started moving together, hunting and feeding together. We all saw this for about a month or two and then they went their separate ways. I don't know how often this happens. There have been one or two records of this happening in different parts of the country, probably because there are no other wolves in the area or all the other wolves have died out. I don't know. But interestingly, this has been documented. This is a very interesting photo evidence of this happening. And this is not two species of dogs uh, sharing a kill. It's not a very ephemeral relationship. This is actually uh, a relationship which lasted about two, two and a half months between two top uh, candid predators of our country. And then they went their own ways. So it's quite interesting to know that this happened. And of course, we have uh, wolves which are considered the top predator in the grasslands. But when you have a top predator, you're going to have a top scavenger. And in our country, that is the striped hyena. We actually have striped hyenas in Africa also, but over there, uh, they are not so often seen and they are few and far between. But in certain parts of India, hyena is actually very, very common and very regularly seen. But albeit they are seen only at night. Uh, in fact, even on the Ranthambore tours I do, sometimes we go out at night to the place where they dump, the butcher dumps the remains of the chicken and we quite often see uh, hyenas coming there at night. So striped hyenas, unlike the African hyena, are not, uh, sp the spotted hyena in Africa are not diurnal. They don't organize themselves in clans, but they're very solitary. They move around in the night only and they're very secretive. And in fact, they really don't have much of a vocalization unlike the spotted hyenas in Africa. And as you can see here in this camera trap, like the wolves, hyenas also heavily rely on the food sources of, from the villages and towns that they live amongst. So these hyenas, despite being large animals, slip into uh, villages, slip into houses, slip into the farms, sometimes go to cattle dumping areas, sometimes move to areas where the butchers throw the remains of the day's cut. And they know, they've figured this all out. So hyenas, especially parts of northern India, survive heavily on uh, secondary habitats. And in fact, there was a recent study done on the food sources uh, from uh, by analyzing hyena's cat. And they realized that the hyenas were surviving heavily by feeding on stray dogs. Like India has a lot of stray dogs which roam around, which don't have any owners. They're just feeding on the waste and they get, they get fed by some people in the village. So hyenas are actually taking down dogs on a regular basis. And that was news to me because we don't see that often because of the hyena secret ways. But when you analyze their scat samples, it is quite interesting that this thing came about. So like I told you, grasslands, uh, probably the habitat that's disappearing the fastest in our country. 
the pastoralists are heavily dependent on the grasslands but people can change their ways but animals can't unfortunately so a lot of these uh, people are also moving out of their traditional ways they're setting up permanent uh, farms and they're setting up uh, they know how to grow their grass in certain areas there is new ways of there's new technology which has come into uh, uh, use for the herdsmen and the farmers so the lifestyle the nomadic lifestyle that they traditionally followed which the wolves were dependent on is kind of gone and along with that if the wolf is losing its traditional habitat too as you can see here this hill this particular hill actually is being cleared out to form uh, an air traffic control center for an airport which is coming in the surrounding grassland and this place has a pack of 25 wolves and also a smaller pack of six wolves so this is in the heart of the country and this is happening in everyone's view but unfortunately it's still happening in a country like india and it's going to be a huge problem for the wolves hyenas the great indian bustard which is also one of the rarest birds in the world which depends on these grasslands these gazelle and a whole lot of other species that depend on the grasslands so we are talking about the wolves because the top carnivore is always a good way to start the story but there is a lot of animals in these grasslands that require uh, a healthy grassland ecosystem for them to survive so where have we jumped we've jumped to the white landscape in northern india which is the area north of the himalaya and this is the same wolf again these are you can see two wolves here the tibetan wolves which is canis lupus shanku a different subspecies and they share their habitat interestingly with the gray ghost of the himalayas the snow leopard and uh, its images like this are very often seen because the wolves sometimes follow snow leopards when they make a kill and they try to steal the kill of the leopard so this is a very interesting animal but this unlike the earlier picture looks like an actual wolf these animals look very much closer to the wolves in eurasia and in the americas and but they're not as big they're much smaller still they're designed to survive in the cold deserts of ladakh and the trans himalaya of india and these animals unlike the packs you see in yellowstone organize themselves into smaller packs because of the lack of availability of prey so a large pack would be about seven eight wolves occasionally you see coalitions about 14 15 wolves in the peak winter months because uh, food is scarce and they like to bring down larger prey together but overall these are smaller wolves which organize themselves into smaller packs adapted to living in cold deserts in extreme conditions so these wolves give birth in the month of may just at the start of spring so that the young ones can be old enough by october november to to brave the winter months and it's a very interesting animal again very poorly studied always living in the shadow of the snow leopard and there is really not much data on this animal so i've been working in ladakh in the habitat of wolves and snow leopards for the last four years and i've been lucky enough to spend uh, quite a bit of time with wolves and snow leopards in that time and what i've seen is the snow leopard gets a lot of compassion from the people a lot of love a lot of understanding and there's a lot of conservation efforts but wolves on the other hand are totally ignored simply because of uh, there is a lot of complications with regards to conservation of wolves in these landscapes so let's talk about that in a, in a little detail not too much so traditionally the wolves hunted over large areas of ladakh they hunted this animal which is the kiang or the tibetan wild ass and other such ungulates which roam the plains of ladakh but over time what has happened is the wolves have figured out that these animals are harder to bring down and the spaces that those animals occupied are also very restricted now so over here too the wolves have started bringing down domestic livestock so it is the same story as wolves do in the rest of the country so here you can see this wolf has brought down or is feeding on a large yak which is probably a very old yak which the wolf was able to bring down and this is the kind of landscape they live in so it is very easy for a wolf to come into a village early in the morning or at night take down a, a sheep or a goat and take it away and again when they are giving birth uh, or when they have a litter to feed they will do this on a regular basis so even here there is a lot of cases of poisoning of wolves and in fact there is other uh, problems for wolves which we will talk about so this picture was seen in 2013 so this pack has about 
12, 13 wolves. And interestingly, uh, this is probably the last such big pack that we have seen in Ladakh. Ever since, I've seen only two, three, four, because most of this pack was wiped out by poisoning uh, by the villagers. Because unfortunately, you can't blame them too, because if they're losing their livestock, these are the Pashmina herders of Ladakh. And this is what you get your Kashmir or the Pashmina stalls from these goats. So this is their bread and butter. And unfortunately, as you can see in this landscape, there's not much wood to cover the cattle corrals uh, or the sheep pens. So what happens is most of these corrals are open uh, at night and they just have a stone wall to protect the animals from the wind. So what happens is uh, the wolves are easy, can easily jump in and uh, take the sheep. And unfortunately, unlike the snow leopard, with in the case of wolves, the whatever they catch is finished off in a matter of a few minutes or a few hours. So there is not much chance for the villager to get compensation by showing proof. Unlike the snow leopard, which feeds on a carcass for a few days, so the villager can take can bring in the the wildlife department and get his compensation. But in the case of wolves, there is no chance of that. So they, after a point, get frustrated and resort to poisoning. And there is also these traditional wolf traps. These are very big uh, well-like structures that are built. And they put some uh, a dead sheep or a goat inside. And the wolves go in and they get stuck inside. And then the villagers come in and pelt the wolves with stones and kill them. But what is nice that you see in this picture is that this wolf trap has been abandoned. And the Buddhists have put up their peace, uh, uh, like a prayer flag over it to show that they will stop using this practice. And that is a positive sign uh, because uh, there has been a little bit of awareness and they've realized they shouldn't be doing this to the wolves. There are people talking about it and they are stopping this practice. But wolves are spread quite thinly over this entire landscape. So we actually do not know what is happening to wolves in other areas. And it is also very hard to monitor because how do you keep track of wolves in a landscape this size, as big as the Himalaya? And how do you keep track of packs? So there is a lot of gaps in our knowledge and in our conservation efforts with regards to Tibetan wolves of India. So coming to the smallest of the lot, the canids, the foxes. And interestingly, we have uh, three different species of foxes in the country. When I say species, uh, we have the sand fox, the Indian fox, or the Bengal fox, and two subspecies of the red fox. Of course, all of you are familiar with the red foxes in the US. Uh, so we have, of course, a Himalayan fox, uh, which is very similar to your red fox. But it is, uh, in fact, the red fox has over 55 different subspecies in the world. And this animal lives in the cold deserts of Ladakh, whereas the desert fox, which is also a subspecies, Vulpus vulpus pusilla, lives in the hot deserts of Rajasthan in India. So probably this is the only subspecies that lives in some of the hottest conditions of the world because all other red foxes, <laughs> except one subspecies in Oman, live in the colder parts of the, uh, of the world, whereas the desert fox lives in a very hot desert, but is also very similar or is the same species as the red fox. So the only way to tell them is, of course, their general body structure and the white-tipped tail, which is a characteristic feature of the red foxes. And during this COVID lockdown, uh, we came across one disturbing news. Unfortunately, I do not have more information on this because of the lockdown. But we heard uh, a friend of mine went there and documented this, that a lot of these foxes, the desert foxes, have got a contagious skin disease and uh, quite a few of them are dying out in their strongholds of Rajasthan. We do not know why this is or what is happening still. Unfortunately, researchers haven't been able to go there to do the work because of the, uh, the situation with the uh, corona and the COVID lockdown in India. But this picture is what came out and a few articles which were very vague. So there is a problem with regards to the population of desert foxes in India. On the other hand, we have a very far widespread endemic fox, which is the Bengal fox or the Indian fox. Of course, you can the first thing you need to notice here is the black tip tail. And of course, the lack of markings anywhere in the body. And it also has these dark tear stripes on either side of its face. So this animal is omnipresent throughout the country in forests, in dry ecosystems, in the high hills of India. 
So it's found in quite a few habitats. And again, like the hyenas and the wolves and the jackals, <coughs> excuse me, they've uh, managed to survive in uh, semi-urban conditions and rural conditions. So they scavenge often, they visit trash dumps, they hunt, like you can see this one, this pup is having a bandicoot rat in its mouth. So they are very adapted to rural, urban, semi-urban, forest and hilly conditions in the country. But the most odd looking fox, probably the most odd looking fox in the world is the Tibetan sand fox, which we get again in the Trans Himalaya region of India. Look at that face. I mean, it doesn't look like an animal which anyone would have thought of, or it looks really, really odd with its uh, bushy tail, the very flat face with a sharp pointed snout, and a half necklace of black on its, uh, on like a collar which forms on the sides of his neck. And it's a very, very strange animal, but in every other aspect, it behaves very similar to the red fox. I, I tried really hard to find out why it has such a flat round face, but there's really been no concrete uh, evidence on why that is so. But if you notice, all the foxes have very hairy ears and a very whiskery snout, uh, simply because very often they need to detect prey underground. So they also have very hairy soles of their feet. Uh, so what happens is they all these hairs act like sensory organs, which uh, detects the slightest movement underground or the slightest change in smell in the air. And that is how they seek their food in these harsh ecosystems that they live in. So even the desert, the sand fox, as you can see, lives in these dry, cold desert conditions in the high Himalaya. And very small part of the uh, sand fox's range comes into India. It is very widespread in Tibet and the parts of China, but it is only found in extreme northern reaches in very specific habitats in India. So we've spoken about uh, the canids. Uh, I'd just like to recap quickly on distribution. So this is India, of course, this is my country. I'm speaking to all of you from this small region in the southern part of India. So this is the range of the Indian wild dog, which is the Dole. So it is found in the forests of central India and the forests, the mountains of western India and parts of uh, the Himalaya, as you can see. It is found in the eastern Himalayas and it is found in the cold deserts of Ladakh and this stretch here. And that is where we found the really bushy red ones, which uh, occupy the snow cap peaks. Of course, this is the range of the jackal. There's no second guessing that, as you can see how widespread this animal is. Uh, these are the two subspecies of wolves, the Indian gray wolf and the Tibetan wolf. Uh, this is where they're found in India. Uh, this is the hyena, of course, very widespread, but unfortunately also diminishing big time because of poisoning and loss of habitat and loss of grassland. So this is a, a map which probably historically was true, but I know for a fact that we do not have hyenas in these parts of the country. We do not have hyenas in this corner. So there is a lot of changes to this map, but you, traditionally or by natural history, you can say that the hyenas are found in all these parts of the country. Of course, this is the red, the red fox group. So this is the desert fox and the red fox over here. And the Indian fox or the Bengal fox occupying the whole of the country. And the Tibetan sand fox forming a very small niche. This, these corners that you see here and here, and you also see that with the wolves, this blue top here and here, they are actually extensions of the cold desert, which is north of the Himalayas. This is the Himalayas forming an arc like this. So these are the cold desert plateaus, which are in the northern reaches of the Himalayas. And that's where the sand fox is found. So we've spoken about wild canids all this while, but there is another big problem coming from another predator. So India is a big country with a big population and a lot of mismanagement of waste. And we have a very poor policy with regards to our stray animals. So what is happening is we have a huge, huge population of feral dogs. Unfortunately, there are huge populations of feral dogs in parts of our wilderness too. So they move into wetlands, they're moving into salt flats to hunt the wild ass. They are actually <laughs> documents of uh, wild dogs organizing them in, themselves into packs and bringing down uh, deer and antelopes in the very same way as uh, wild dogs and wolves do. And unfortunately, events like this are also become common. You can see a young leopard cat, which is a beautiful small cat in our country, 
which has been taken down by two dogs which caught it in a coffee plantation in south india it's a very very sad situation with regards to feral dogs the part of the problem is definitely down to humans but unfortunately there is a lot of sentiment when it comes to uh, feral dogs and any dogs for that matter uh, so there is a, no effort to uh, control the population there is no effort to uh, sedate the males and make sure they don't breed further in fact you can see that this feral dog here is chasing a desert fox so there is a lot of influence of feral dogs on wild canids too and this animal is the result of that so this is a picture i took in the trans himalaya of ladakh and this animal is the result of this a feral dog mating with a wild tibetan wolf and you have this very odd looking animal which is called a kipchang k i p c h a n g locally by the local people and i have seen this animal dominate wolf packs breed with other wolves and dogs and become a very very dominant animal so what does that mean for the wolf population the traditional wolf population the tibetan wolf population is now getting polluted with the dna and the genes of a feral dog and this is the result so these animals by the year in ladakh and that's a very very scary situation again because of excessive waste and mismanagement of our dog population and of course a lot of sentiments are also involved when it comes to dogs so the story of canids is very unlike the story of cats their challenges they face is very unlike the challenges faced by cats and unfortunately uh, we are not really speaking much about the dogs in india or anywhere else in the world unless they are the top carnivore as you have in places like yellowstone so they've always been playing second fiddle to in the conservation circles and i really hope that changes for the sake of the environment as such as a whole and not just the dogs uh, as a separate species because you can see through this last 40 45 minute talk that we've had how important they can be for various ac aspects of the ecosystem and this picture kind of sums up the situation with uh, the wild uh, canids of india you can see that there's a wolf waiting his chance to feed on this cow while a pack of feral dogs have taken over and this is the reality of canids in our country i really hope uh, that was uh, you could uh, understand what i was trying to say because india is a very different country very distant the dynamics of our country and people are very different but the problems that our wildlife face is very similar to the problems wildlife face anywhere else in the world and i think all of us can relate to that at any time we've spoken to thank you so much and i look forward to some questions Surya, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. What an enlightening presentation. Uh, we do have quite a few questions here. Thank you, Ted. Uh, uh, before we hop into them, I just want to remind everybody that if you do have a question, uh, please enter it in the question section of your GoToWebinar control panel. All right. Uh, a couple of folks asked questions about the relationships of the dolls, the, the painted dogs, and whether they, or excuse me, the dogs and whether they are related to the painted dogs of Africa or or perhaps Siberian Huskies, uh, any other species? None. Of None. So the Kuan Alpinus genus is a single species genus, and uh, these dole are actually probably historically found all the way till Russia, and they moved from uh, the parts of Siberia, like I told you, during the ice ages, and moved towards the tropics. But they are the only species of their kind in the genus. So they're very different, very unique. Their muzzle is very different. Their dentition is very different. The number of teeth they have is very different. So it is a very, very different animal. In fact, a lot of scientists don't consider it to be a true canid. Uh, it's not a true dog, as they say. But in every respect, otherwise, it is a dog. It behaves like a dog, but it is a different genus. So it has no relationship to the painted dogs of Africa or any other wild dog found anywhere else in the world. All right. Uh, earlier on, you spoke about uh, some of the, the the fluctuations in dog numbers or in canid numbers related to diseases. Um, and a, a question we had come in was related to viral or tick-borne or, or other types of parasites. Are there programs in place to prevent and or control the transmission of these types of uh, health issues <laughs> amongst both domestic and, and wild canids? Okay, so that that's a very interesting question. So there is two ways uh, the disease spreads uh, one is of course it is always there in a very subdued form in their dna 
and that uh, strain pops up every few generations and leads to a drop in the dog population and then it subsides again and then the dogs thrive so this is actually how disease works in canids anywhere but unfortunately in recent years what is happening is like i told you we have we have a lot of feral dogs in the wilderness and they come in contact with wild canids and there is a lot of disease transmission there because the wild canids are not as resistant as our feral dogs to disease because the feral dogs are far more immune because of the conditions they live in the wild uh, canids are uh, more pure in their natural habitat so when they come across feral dogs the disease con uh, contraction is much faster and much easier and we've actually seen a, a further a decline in wild populations of canids because of interactions with feral animals and it need not necessarily be only dogs even cattle uh, there is also uh, uh, cattle spread uh, 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 tb and different other diseases and there's also some uh, uh, mouth cancer which is also found in certain canid species in our country uh, people are still trying to find the source of it or whether it needs to be controlled i believe if it's a natural occurrence maybe it doesn't need to be controlled like i told you uh, things will it's a cycle but if you see uh, a prevalent disease uh, which is spreading because of artificial situations created by feral dogs or any other such reason then yes uh, there has to be intervention and there has to be treatment most likely the treatment will be isolation of the unaffected population from the affected population because otherwise there's no real cure for any of this if, it, if it's uh, rabies or if it's uh, distemper or if it's mange the dog which gets it will weaken eventually and die but we can make sure the rest of the pack survives and that's pretty much how it works great thank you for that um we have a, a, a host of questions around conservation efforts which which will be really great to, to dive into there uh, just to start off, are any of the canids endangered or under any sort of protected status? Uh, uh, definitely. Uh, unfortunately, the wolves, in the situation of wolves, people don't classify subspecies yet. So the wolf population is widespread world over, so they don't really say it's uh, danger, uh, endangered. But definitely the Indian gray wolf, the Tibetan wolf, the Indian wild dog or the dole are all critically endangered animals. Uh, their habitats are shrinking, their numbers are vastly reduced, and they are facing new challenges on a daily basis. So definitely the dole is uh, an endangered animal. Despite its wide range, you can imagine that uh, a predator which is successful on a daily basis in the forest is not going to be welcome in all habitats. So there is also conflict with people in some areas. When I say people with regards to livestock, and, uh, there's been no instances of dole going after people but with regards to livestock. So the challenges faced by canids, because they don't have territories, they don't stick to the same area like cats do, uh, is far more. And when they need vast spaces in, in a country like India, where space is the biggest problem, uh, you can be sure that uh, all our uh, canids are facing a dire situation. But to answer your question uh, more specifically, the dole and the Indian gray wolf are critically endangered whereas the other ones are vulnerable or are not so endangered or they're quite prevalent. Excellent. And can you, can you speak to some of the conservation efforts that are being done for these canids, whether that be um, education of grasslands protection or uh, other types of protected area management? Uh, is WWF doing any work related to these, these, these animals? Uh, uh, what, what types of conservation efforts are in place and are they being successful? Okay, so that's again interesting. Uh, basically, uh, WWF is working on the Tibetan wolves of Ladakh, uh, along with the Snow Leopard Conservancy and a few other organizations, because all these years the focus has been on snow leopards and the community. So they've done a very good job with regards to uh, associ uh, making the community understand snow leopards, live with them, and benefit from the presence of snow leopards with regards to tourism or anything. But what is happening uh, with wolves, like I told you, it's a very different situation because the wolves feed heavily on domestic livestock and there is a lot of hatred with regards to wolves, even amongst communities which have learned to love snow leopards. So how do you solve a situation like that? I mean, it's a very difficult situation to solve simply because you can't suddenly tell the wolves to go back to their wild prey. They're not going to do that. Uh, and in a place like uh, Ladakh, where in remote conditions, people are grazing their goats and sheep for generations together they're not going to change their ways of life also so in a situation like that it's a very delicate uh, place to be in but there is a lot of awareness being created there's a lot of education that's happening 
but more than anything uh, right now i think the government in ladakh along with the wwf and uh, the snow leopard conservancy are trying to figure out a way to neuter uh, the feral dogs which are affecting the wild wolves so i think that is the biggest step they can do at this moment to safeguard the gene pool otherwise you are just safeguarding an animal which is not wild truly you know uh, you're you'll be safeguarding across so first we need to say, say make sure the wild gene pool survives and then get into the uh, intricacies of conservation and awareness creation and education with regards to the other wolves in our country uh, the wild dogs the dole live in protected areas in forests so their situation is very different so they come under the forest protection act and they are a very well protected animal within their range but with the indian grey wolf which i like i told you lives in the uh, fallow lands agricultural lands following nomadic herders the situation is also very bad so the grasslands trust is an organization which is fighting very hard to document and study these animals first ensure that their range is well documented and uh, making sure that uh, the wolves are uh, individually identified like all of uh, like it is there in the yellowstone so that we can actually make sure that we understand their group dynamics the numbers their range and then make sure there is a lot of uh, protest against developmental activities in those areas so you have to remember that most of these wolves live in non protected areas in fact uh, there was a survey which was done i think in the 80s uh, for wolves throughout the country and one of the areas where there were very good numbers of wolves was is currently now the delhi airport so that will kind of give you the picture of the story of wolves in our country the delhi airport sits in erstwhile wolf country and that is the reality of wolves in our country most of them live in non protected areas so there is not really much government protection but there is a lot of uh, non governmental organizations and individuals working very hard even during this lockdown to make sure wolves are well documented and their dens are protected and the people are very often spoken to with regards to awareness Excellent. Thank you for that great information. Uh, we've got time for one final question here. Uh, a number of folks are, are curious uh, how and, and where they would be able to see some of these candidates uh, uh, throughout India. You showed those great maps of where they all live, but is it possible to visit and, and view some of them in nature? Are there NADHAB trips that, that you're able to see some of these? On? Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, the NADHAB trips are definitely very good to see these candidates. Uh, uh definitely the dole uh, almost a lot of people who come on the grand india wildlife tour which is a winter tour a lot of the most of the groups see the wild dog or the dole uh, especially in parks like khanha and batamgarh where the numbers of dole are very good so you you that is the tour which covers the rhinos the tigers uh, you do have a chance of seeing leopards but more often than not you do see wild dogs in the parks that you cover uh, with regards to hyenas like i told you i do the summer uh, tiger tour uh, which is uh, india's top predator the tiger so i do the tiger photography and it's a short trip to ranthambore uh, which is right at the edge of the desert so we have a very interesting mix of uh, canids there so we've seen wolves on those trips and we've seen hyenas we've seen uh, indian foxes and on one occasion i've seen desert foxes so there are better places to see desert foxes and other foxes uh, Uh, apart from the areas that natab covers because natab doesn't specifically go to some places to look for these smaller foxes uh, but if a person is interested specifically to see a candidate on the tour if he lets uh, a tour lead tour leader or an expedition leader like me know that he'd like to see this then definitely after safaris we can go for a walk or a drive at night and look at these trash dumps and uh, the sites where the cattle carcasses are dumped or the butcher dumps is waste and you can be pretty sure that you can see a hyena or one of the foxes or the jackals for sure in such areas so we do cover that but definitely the wild dogs is part of the tour and uh, the other canids can be done in ranthambore if a person is keen and interested it might require one or two sleepless nights but that's worth it i guess <laughs> excellent sir thank you very much and i uh, i'm afraid we're running low on time right now uh, we weren't able to get to all of the questions but i want to thank everybody in the audience for uh all of you <clears throat> and, and also submitting those questions uh before we sign off sir do, do you need any closing comments for our audience today well uh, i look forward to seeing you all in india soon <laughs> i can say only that i mean it's a beautiful country it's a great country avoid the cities 
and have a lot of good fun in the wilderness. Like I, I've shifted to the wilderness and I live a beautiful life here. It's a lovely place. Uh, and I hope to see you all here. I think I'd like to say that to all of you, yes. Great, thank you so much, sir. It was really a treat to have you with us today. Uh, my thanks to everyone who joined us as well. Please be sure to join us again tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. Uh, we did record today's presentation and we'll have that replay available on our website soon and you'll also receive an email uh, with that recording. So with that, I will conclude our, webin our webinar for the day. Goodbye everybody and thank you again. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.